And welcome to our latest Saturday show called Patriot's Lament. I am Steve Floyd, here behind the microphone, helping to make sure that everything gets orchestrated. Joining me in the studio, across from me and uh, slightly to my right, is uh, Dave Diesel, our local capital anarchist. Or what do you call yourself? An anarcho-capitalist, is that right? Yeah, that's it. An anarcho-capitalist, and you're technically with the uh, Fairbanks Campaign for Liberty. And uh, joining us by phone this morning, we've also got uh, Josh Bennett from Big Horn Enterprises. Good morning, Josh. Morning. Crony capitalist here. What kind of uh, crony capitalists? <laughs> Aren't we all crony capitalists, really, when it comes down to it? We all contribute to the crony capitalism with our tax dollars, right? Yeah. So I guess that technically makes us all crony capitalists. Fund us or else. <laughs> right. All right, gentlemen. The, the main point of the show is that we talk about liberty here. We talk about how to get it, how to keep it, uh, how you know what to do to keep from losing it. But really, uh, isn't liberty something that, that God gives us? Something that we have inherently, and that some that that we either surrender to other people, or people come and take from us by force. Uh, well, even then, we still have uh, we have the choice to obey or not, right? Ultimately, we get to get to choose to comply or not. So even even if they use force, they can't actually take your liberty, unless they take your life. Uh, right, but then you re- you retain your liberty. It's just not very practical. <laughs> <laughs> they may take our lives, that's, but they'll never take our freedom. That's right. Freedom is a state of mind. <laughs> right. And uh, my goodness. I, well, I you know I actually watched a video on that uh, today, and this guy this guy's contention was that uh, humans are unique in that they're the only creature on the planet that has a conscious fear of death. Right. And so that makes humans uniquely controllable in ways that you can't control animals. Um, you know, if you point a gun at a chicken, you can't get it to lay more eggs. But and you can't, you know, and you don't need to do that to get the eggs from the chicken. But um, you know, putting putting it under stress and and in a in a situation where it's controlled by force, you actually you get lower yield. You know, and a, a farmed animal that's healthy is going to be better than a farmed animal that's um, constantly living under the threat of death. But humans actually respond in a different way to that. Um, if you you know you point a gun at the proverbial guy working a nine to five job, and he'll actually give you some of his eggs for the rest of his life. Uh, aren't you also though going to see lower productivity from people who are under that kind of stress? Aren't you going to yeah, see? You will, you will, but you won't see you know you won't see none. You can get a you can get a yield doing that uh, because the the human uniquely fears death in a way that the animal doesn't. That's an interesting point. Gentlemen, we've already got some lines uh, on hold. Would you like to go to the phones? 458-TALK yeah, sure. is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? All right, they didn't hold. How about you? Good morning. Hello. Hey, who is this? It's Carl. Carl, good morning. What's on your mind? Well, I'd like to introduce a new phrase. Instead of calling the United States the policeman of the world, we're the zookeepers of the world. <laughs> because because if you look at it, I mean, call me a racist. I study things. I'm a technocrat. But, but you know, you look at it. You got different races of people. You can judge them any color you want to, you know. Um, and, and, and we're the zookeepers of the world. So, you know, yeah, you don't want to give a, a gorilla a gun because... In a zoo, because he might go around shooting at people and us. So, so that's 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 my new phrase I'd like to coin to be used more. Huh. Well, as far as we go, we're on the farm. I mean, we don't. The vast majority of us aren't pointing guns at anyone. We're the we're the dumb cows who are being corralled into an ever smaller field by the uh, very insignificant number of farmers who are preparing to slaughter us. So I don't know. I don't, I, don't think there's are... any, I don't think there's any room for any Americans to be laughing at all the people who, um, quote-unquote, we are killing around the world, because it's not us who's doing it. Just remember, Dave, all animals are equal. <laughs> yeah. Some animals are just more equal than others. Right. <laughs> Thanks for the call. 458-TALK is a number. If there's something on your mind this morning, feel free to call in and share it with the rest of the class. Uh, I don't, gentlemen. I, Josh, I are on the phone, and uh, Dave, have you guys heard about this latest uh, training exercise in Florida? This was a story that just came out yesterday. Let me read uh, part of the story for you, and then get your reaction. 
It may have looked like they were ready for war or some deranged person looking for his late Social Security benefits, but it was only Federal Protective Service officers with the U.S. Department of Homeland Security who were conducting a random training operation early Tuesday morning when they surprisingly showed up at the Social Security Administration office building in downtown Leesburg. This is Leesburg, Florida, and this I'm reading directly from the Daily Commercial out of Leesburg. With their blue and white SUVs circled around the Main Street office, at least one official was posted on the door with a semi-automatic rifle, randomly checking identifications. And some other officers, some with canines, sifted through the building. Laura Kelly, who took a friend to the office on Tuesday, said, quote, I thought someone was upset about not getting their check. According to one Homeland official in the Washington, D.C. office, Operation Shield is an effort that uses routine, unannounced visits by FPS inspectors to test the effectiveness of contract guards or protective security officers, quote, detecting the presence of unauthorized persons and potentially disruptive or dangerous activities, unquote. Part of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, the FPS is the federal law enforcement agency that provides integrated security and law enforcement services to over 9,000 federally owned and leased buildings, facilities, properties, and other assets. Others on the scene wouldn't speak to the press, and by noon they were gone. But Thomas Milligan, the district manager for the Social Security Administration office, said that while the visit came as a surprise, the office was ready. He said the, he added that the officers checked videos, security measures, alarm systems, and more. He said, quote, it was to make sure security measures are in place and property properly followed, unquote. Um, I hadn't heard of that one specifically, but... It just in, happened this week. Yeah. There was another one, um, another Homeland Security exercise. Prob- it was in uh, either November or December. It was just a couple months ago. And they were doing an unannounced um, exercise out kind of in, in public, so to speak. And the police, the police actually responded to it. And there was... There was like a little standoff because uh, DHS didn't feel the need to notify um, the local police that they were going to be running around with guns uh, doing an an exercise. So it's kind of funny to see the uh, agencies on different levels um, having their little their little turf war. Uh, You know, well, it, it reminds me, though, of the little turf wars that you saw in Germany. In the 1930s. Oh yeah, sure. Well, yeah, and th- and that yeah, you had you had some um, battles over who will who will uh, be in charge, SS, SA, etc. Uh, J- Josh, what do you think of this? I mean, is this is this something that uh, we should be expecting more of, or is this just a what well, as they said a random security check that nothing nothing that we should be concerned about? I read that story in Florida too. They were checking the guard. Is that what they were saying? They were they were checking the security measures, but they started randomly checking everybody's ID. Right. I mean, well, how do you check the security measures there unless the security people start shooting them? Oh, oh man. Hey, there's a wow. There's an interesting question. Why wouldn't? I mean, that would be the ultimate security check, wouldn't it? Yeah. Maybe that's something Lindsey Graham will propose. Wow, you guys are making me. You're gonna. You're seriously. You're gonna make me crazy. Uh, I've got another story here out of uh, the L.A. Times. This is not some fringe source here. This was uh, from the last week in December on how TSA screenings aren't just for airports anymore, with roving security teams increasingly visiting train stations, subways, and other man trans- mass transit sites to deter terrorism. And critics say it's largely political theater. Uh, but here they, they, this is again the LA Times reporting on the TSA going in and setting up their checkpoints, these roving teams at uh, Amtrak, Amtrak stations. They say, quote, we're not the airport security administration. We take the transportation part of our name seriously. They're, they're so called Viper teams, the visible intermodal prevention and response, have run more than 9,300 unannounced checkpoints and other search operations in the last year. So you remember earlier this year we were talking about how this was happening in Tennessee, and we had callers saying, oh, no, no, you're just, (laughs) you're blowing that out of proportion. That was just one incident. Here it is, the L.A. Times. The L.A. Times reporting that there have been 9,000, more than 9,300 unannounced checkpoints 
and other search operations that have been set up by these visible intermodal prevention and response teams, these Viper teams from the TSA. Gentlemen, where are we headed with this? What's going on? Uh, joining us now in the studio, too, uh, Aaron Bennett from Farner Tactical. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning, Steve. Uh, you realize the show does start at 10 o'clock, right? Um, well, yours does. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks for being here. All right. So the question remains here now with the TSA uh, taking seriously that they are the transportation security administration, not just the airport security administration. They are going to be setting up more of these Viper teams, unannounced roadblocks. What does that mean to our Constitution? I feel a lot safer. I, I mean, I don't know about the Constitution, but it makes me feel pretty safe. And that's sarcasm. Yeah. I can tell. I think we all need to draft a thank you letter to the Bush administration. <laughs> what, what, what are you going to say, John? An extra, they asked for money for an extra 2,200 checkpoints for this year alone that Congress gave them. 2,200 more than what they had last year. Wow. Pretty <laughs> uh, That is. Yeah, I guess along the... Uh, well, they have their, their so-called constitution-free zones along the Mexican border, too, that go, what, 100 miles in from the border? Wow. Something something like that. Where constitution-free zones? Yeah, so, like so-called. Right, because if, um, if, if you run across one of those checkpoints, your, your Bill of Rights is suspended within that area from the border for, for your own safety, of course. I like that. I like having my 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 freedom suspended for the sake of my my safety. Yeah, that's that's exactly what I need. You know, it's interesting too as we look at this as this becomes more quote routine, uh, as they're they're saying no 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 this was just a routine identity check this was just a routine security check. Uh, what makes it routine to have the the Fourth Amendment mean nothing? If you don't have a search warrant, if you don't have uh, a, a judge saying, yes, this is a warranted search, there is a reason for it, then then by having your papers and your persons not secure, doesn't our Fourth Amendment really mean absolutely nothing? Fourth of what bit? The Fourth Amendment, yeah, the Fourth of what bit, yeah, exactly. That's about, didn't there, uh, what David said about a constitution-free zone, that's kind of cool. I wonder if you put up a sign, like a flashing sign before the checkpoint that, said, that actually said that constitution free zone and then you see you had a detour sign to go around it i wonder how many people would go straight on into it well unfortunately the detour sign would probably lead you through mexico yeah <laughs> well you know we have gun free zones around the schools Right, and that that keeps guns out. Well, there's dr- there's drug free zones yeah, in schools yeah, too, and Lord yeah. knows the hardest there place, the hardest place to get drugs, Steve, <laughs> in a society, especially American society, is at school. That's definitely not the easiest place to get them. All right, uh, four five eight talk is the number if you've got something to say or something to add to this. I oh, you, prisons prisons are a great example of how yeah. well this works. Right, when you give the state complete and total control over a population. And you have guys in cages. And what do you ha- what do you have in prison? You have rampant drug use and drug trade, and and you know unbounded crime, so called, right? And so when you let this go to its logical conclusion, uh, prison should be some sort of government utopia. They have the state has complete control over the entire population, and uh, it's not the case. And so just because you're making a prison without the cage uh, through these laws doesn't mean you're going to get a different outcome. How do you answer people who say that we are blowing this out of proportion, that, that really we're, we're taking this and we're making a mountain out of a molehill? There's really nothing to all of this. How about, how about you go after that one, Josh? <laughs> yeah. I, I have to point out to, what, three weeks ago, four weeks ago? The mountain out of the molehill, yeah. Because um, it's actually happening. I mean, it's not blowing out of proportion where it's actually happening right in Fairbanks, Alaska. Well, and for somebody who doesn't know, you actually had your home invaded by armed men. With, right. with, uh, they, they, they were wearing costumes. I was at a constitution-free zone, though, at the time. No, they, you, you asked to see their warrant, and they, they, what, they complied? They showed you the warrant when they came into your house? They told me to get out of the way. Don't cause any trouble. They told you so. So you said no, no. You must have a warrant be in, in order for the <laughs> the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution says that you have to have a warrant in order for me to be safe and secure in my persons and papers. And they said, eh? uh-huh. eh? 
And, and so they, so basically, they they forced their way into your house, and you had to make a choice as to whether or not you were going to stand aside and let these men trample on your constitutional rights, or take some kind of a stand for what you know to be right, and basically end up, uh, well, dead. I mean, that's that's always a possibility when I mean, you've got guys with guns. Yeah, that's still alive. You could take it a lot further than that anyway and just point to history. Anybody that can't look at history and realize where we're headed, Nazi Germany, <clears throat> then I don't even know what to tell them in the first place. You know, that's a really good point, Aaron, because even all of the stuff about the routine, you know, the TSA, that's just routine. This, uh, The Viper teams, that's just routine. It was just a routine identity check, all that stuff. That's exactly what the Germans told the Jews about uh, how they ended up getting them into uh, ghettos. People wonder, how did it happen? How did the Jews get rounded up and put in ghettos in the first place? It's because they were telling them this is a temporary security measure. Everything's going to be okay. Just go about your everyday life because well, there's nothing to, work, to concern yourself with. It's absolutely correct. It is routine for government to round people up and detain them and eventually destroy them. That is pretty routine. Yeah. I'll give the TSA that. They're not lying. It's routine. We did it to the Japanese here at home. Yeah. No. I see. Four five eight. You know, well, actually, that's a good point. Un, you know, um, the Japanese were rounded up in uh, during World War II, and after the war, you actually had uh, certain laws and regulations and things like that that went away. You know, the Japanese they had their property stolen, but then they were they were let free after the war, eventually. And uh, boy, what else? Oh, like the the rationing, you know, during World War II of supplies and goods that went away after the war. Um, but right now. There's no there's no war. I mean, there's the so-called war on terror, but that's never going to end because terror is a tactic, and you can't actually wage a war if you don't have an enemy. Um, so there's no possibility of any of this stuff going away when the so-called war ends, right? War well, will not end. It won't the, end. But the Indefinite Detention Act says very clearly that the people who are rounded up and put in jail will be let free after the, it, it the hostilities are over. <laughs> That's right. It's not It's not indefinite. It's only until the end of hostilities, David. <laughs> right, on. or until you die. 458 Talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Uh, yeah, this is Pat. I'm in Delta on my cell phone here. Can you hear me? Pat, we can hear you. Go ahead. What's on your mind? Well, I really uh, enjoy your show, and you guys are doing a great job. A lot of I'd like to just say something. I'm sure you, a lot of you are on my side of this anyway, but for people listening, uh, you know, this is the first year we've ever had a, the opportunity to use the current political process to actually get a constitutional uh, candidate elected president, and it's such an opportunity, you know, and if we don't use it, you know, we're, we're really going to have a lot a harder job in the, the next time around, and, you know, we need to send people to the Republican Party and not just vote on Super Tuesday, but get delegates from the Fairbanks area to join the delegate process, you know? Dave, would you like to yeah. respond well, to that? Yeah, I mean, they just had their uh, primary in Iowa, and um, I would I would assume that you're, uh, you're talking about Ron Paul, of course, and um, he did fairly well in, in Iowa, but... It's it's interesting. I mean, there's two ways to look at that. He got 22% in Iowa, and Romney and Santorum got 25% each. And so I was actually talking to a friend of mine about this last night, and he was saying, you know, it's on the one hand, it's great that Ron Paul's doing better this time. On the other hand, it's depressing that over half of Republicans would vote for Romney or Santorum. And one thing I pointed out was that the people who vote for Ron Paul and support Ron Paul aren't doing it because he has nice hair or this, you know, really energetic personality. Uh, they're doing it because they believe in his philosophy. And so the the people, you know, if you talk somebody into Ron Paul or if you get them interested and they really, really like the guy, they're actually learning a philosophy. And, and it's not, you know, Ron Paul supporters don't support somebody else because nobody else actually has any philosophy behind them. Um, so even if, you know, supporting him politically and and being a delegate in the state convention, you know, there's there's a place for all of that. Um, but I think actually the the bigger thing Ron Paul's doing is he's interjecting a real philosophy philosophy into the political realm, and the people who pick up on that, you know, a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, aren't going to be swayed by these other candidates. The, a Ron Paul supporter doesn't go and support somebody else because there's nobody else with any philosophy to support. Thanks for the call, and thanks for listening down in Delta Junction. 458-TALK is the number. If there's something on your mind, feel free to call in. we got about uh, three minutes before the Fox News here at the bottom of the hour. 
and I, I would like to shift gears for just a moment because part of the, the stated purpose of this show is to focus on the Constitution and make sure that people are aware of what it says and are aware of what is happening to the Constitution, the way in which it is being subverted by the people that we elect to represent us and to go about the business of government. Now, what does the Constitution say about the electoral process, about the party process? Dave? It doesn't It doesn't say anything about the, the party process. Okay, how about you, Aaron? What, is the, what does it say? about? Are we supposed to have a two-party process? Isn't that outlined in the Constitution? That no, you we're only supposed to have a Republican party. Okay. <laughs> right, one party. Josh, what does the Constitution say about about all of this uh, political party nonsense? I mean, nonsense. What, where am I going? I'm, trying, I'm between my true feelings. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I don't remember it saying anything. I know quite a few people who wrote or had a hand in writing it had several things to say about uh, a two-party system or the system itself, actually. I actually don't think any of them that wrote it would believe that it would go this far anyways and this long. I thought, I'm pretty sure like Jefferson assumed we'd be on to bigger and better things by now than trying to figure this mess out. Yeah, they thought it was a basis for um, for kind of future progress towards less and less uh, government than they'd even started. Not not a basis for totalitarianism. However, they warned about that as a possibility. They saw in the Constitution that they had written the ability of the government to step in and control every area of our lives, which is why the Ten Amendments were included. I think, yeah, that's that's true. I think that they would probably be surprised that totalitarianism is being implemented without the Constitution being officially repealed or anything. Like, the administrative lengths to which these agencies and bureaucrats and politicians go to get around the Bill of Rights, I think would astound uh, the founders. Because the king certainly didn't have to... He didn't bother with that much paperwork. He, he just said, hey, you know... I'm I'm sending you to a penal colony in Australia. Have a nice life. Um, he didn't bother with you know going to the parliament or whatever and getting you know an exception to the rule and some legal language and all that other junk. Make sure that we have that citizenship revoked for those who are dissenters. Right, right. No, no HR 1366 with the king. So I think they would be astounded at at that because they they'd probably just go, why didn't you just repeal the constitution and have a king? It'd be easier. That's a that's a really good point. Why not just I want a king? king. <laughs> You've got one. You just don't realize it yet. Uh, you, okay, gentlemen, here's a, a question for you, and we got about a minute left for you to respond, so it's going to be a quick answer. Uh, coming up on 2012, the electoral process. What do you think the possibilities are that we're going to see the elections suspended because of some kind of national emergency? I, I don't think they will. Uh, I, I used to think that they would be, and I don't think they will, because that's the the more effective way to control it is to have meaningless elections, where you still have the whole dog and pony show, but it doesn't mean anything, because then people don't realize anything's wrong, or if you say something's wrong, you're a nutcase. All right, Aaron, yeah. what do you think? Oh, definitely not going to suspend it. So, you, so you think we're going to see uh, the the meaningless elections continue? Because really, you could say that all every election that we've had for the last. Uh, well, 20, 30 years has been in that pattern. It really hasn't mattered. Look at the policies. Well, we don't, if we don't give the right-wing Christian conservative movement the chance to get in Republicans, they might get mad. Welcome to the Madhouse. That's an interesting choice in music, Dave. Thanks for yeah, I figured it was for bringing that in. Uh, then welcome back to Patriots Lament. I'm Steve Floyd, uh, the monkey behind the machine. On the other side of the council this morning, we've got Dave Giesel from the Fairbanks Campaign for Liberty, and we've also got Aaron Bennett. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning again. Uh, from the uh, from Far North Attica, and on the phone from Bighorn Enterprises, we've got uh, Josh Bennett. Good morning, Josh. Good morning. All right, you ready to go back to the phones? Yeah. Four five eight talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? This is Randy. Randy. Good morning. What's on your mind? Well, I just thought I'd offer a dissenting viewpoint <laughs> on the political parties, and I hope you don't hang up on me too quick like you did yesterday. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings yesterday by 
offering a dissenting... Uh, oh, you know, Randy, I don't mind dissension. What I mind, though, is uh, the subversion that you are trying to do and by, by insisting that somehow politics is nothing more than a game, that this is that's, this is something to be compared with any other kind of a board game, which I'm, I'm offended at that, to be quite honest. Well, I'm a, I apologize for <laughs> stepping on your toes and making you feel bad about that. I, was, I did bring up the uh, football league and sports to show that uh, oftentimes things are whittled down and winnowed down you know, like uh, we've got the 16 football teams, and pretty soon it's going to be eight, and then it's going to be four, and then it's going to be two in the Super Bowl, and that's just the way the way it happens. There's nothing wrong with that, and we get a system of two. You know, when we're trying to find one. How, uh, how many how many um, football teams point guns at their fans to fill the stadium? No, <laughs> not enough. So how how is that a valid analogy to the state? Well, I, I'm I wasn't talking about the coerciveness of the state. I was talking about political parties. I was just saying that. Uh, the basic two political party system we have, even though we have other political parties, is just a natural evolution when free people are free to do things the way they want to try to uh, get the people that they want elected elected. In other words, if it was just the liberal that co- the liberal. How many that, how many uh, cell phone companies or computer companies or automotive companies or uh, home builders or plumbers are there in this town? Uh, are there two? Do you have two choices in the car you buy, two choices in the phone you buy, two choices in the store you go to to get your food? No, we have many, many choices. Yes, like we, we have, have many. So actually, like have when you have free people, when you have free people, Randy, yeah. uh-huh. free to make their own decisions yeah. and free to buy what they want and interact how they want, you have far more than two choices. Yeah, just like we have many parties, but people tend freely. In other words, I'm, I'm a member of the Republican Party. Some other listeners may be a member of the Democratic Party, some members of the Green. We all have freedom to become members and to participate as we wish. No one's forcing me to be a member of the Republican Party. No one's forcing Ron Paul to be a member of the Republican Party. He chooses to. And in the atmosphere of freedom, we have coalesced into two basic parties because there's basically two basic directions you can go with more government control and a little less government control. So wait, 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 wait. So which party is for less government control? Can you tell me that? The Republican Party in general. Okay, so the, explain, give me, a, give me a Republican president who has shrunk the size of government. Uh, I guess during the Eisenhower administration, they kind of had the Taft-Hartley Act, which wow. kind of... <laughs> so we're the, really, we're wow. really stretching it. You have to go back 60 are, years to get that one. <laughs> we're That's really awesome. stretching it when we say that, when we say that, the, that they're pushing in different directions. They are pushing Clinton, in different directions. Clinton grew government less than... Left. Uh, Putting group government less than George Bush did. Yeah, Randy, uh, let me ask you this. When you say that uh, nobody's coercing anybody to to join a party, uh, if somebody comes out with a different party and, uh, say, the Tea Party, for instance, uh, which really isn't a party at all, it's just kind of a movement of people, and then you have members of another political party infiltrating and intentionally subverting that party, how is that not a violent force into that two-party system. Can you explain that to me? Well, if you're talking about the Tea Party, and I've joined the Tea Party because I've held a sign on corners before with the Tea Party and the 912 movement, and I guess anybody can uh, join in and hold a sign. I mean, I, I went and joined in. I didn't join, but, I mean, at a distance, I went to the Occupy Fairbanks thing when they first had it back in September, whenever it was, and I could have joined right in the group. I don't think they would have killed me or kicked me out or anything, but I chose to stand aside and just take some pictures. But... Uh, we just have freedom freedom to, in this country, so that's why. That's your answer. All right. Thanks for the call, Randy. 458-TALK is the number. We move on to the next call. Good morning. Who is? All right. Looks like we uh, we had a, a series of people who called in and decided not to stay on the line while Randy was there. Go ahead, Josh. Did you have something you were going to say? Yeah. The two-party system is not something that we naturally came to because of our freedom. two-party system is actually a one-party system that they put together to maintain and control power. You know, how obvious is this? You really got to be a, sorry, but a jackass, not realize that two parties are actually one in maintaining their power because nothing ever changes. Bureaucracies never change. The laws never change. It doesn't matter who's at the head of the wheel. Nothing changes. I saw a video with Judge uh, Palatano today uh, on uh, Ron Paul News, Ron Paul Daily Paul or something like that. It was really good about it. And the whole thing was, what if these people are lying to it? And that both parties are actually the same power structure making a stake because we're stupid enough to go vote for them over and over, that we actually have a choice. And the real choice is there is no choice. 
no matter who you vote for. Thank you for making my head explode. 458 Talk is a number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? It's Cecily. Good morning, Cecily. Go ahead. Good morning. Well, it's, I agree with her. There's, it's a dog and pony show, and it has been since the 60s, at least as long as I've been alive. And uh, there, if you go out and vote, you're just playing a, you know, a, a moot game, and they've, they've uh, pretty much got you by the, you know, Short hairs, I guess, is what it is, and and you see it in our own town when when the when the uh, mayor and the bureau and what they even want to come start checking out your animals in your house. There were another reason to come down your road to take away your uh, freedoms and uh-huh. and tell you how to to live. Now, Cecily, if somebody didn't tell you how to take care of your animal, how would you know how to do that? Come on, you know you're just a child. You need somebody to tell you what to do. Well, you know, at 4-H, they really teach you a lot when you're young, and and books, and 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 uh, the library. They have everything about how to take good care of your animals, and and they already already have laws against people hurting their animals and and neglecting their animals. And now they just want to have a police force that you pay for from your taxes, and then not only that, after. After they've had their job, they you got to pay for their retirement and their health and their everything. While you're just you can buy with your animals and your vegetables that you grew yourself, they just want some of whatever you got in order to lazily um, shuffle papers in a in a building with lights that no. make you even sicker than you started out when you got there. Oh that. no no no! You see that sounds like communism. That's not our system, Cecily. <laughs> yeah, no. but we have our... elections here. But they're, that's, that, they did that's there a fake. Those are fake. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I didn't vote to, for for those animal control people. I didn't vote for them to take your money so that until you get your driveway the way they figure they you should have it. And I didn't. You know, it's just I'm I I really it hurts me to pay taxes to hire 20 people to rob my brother. It it just it just. Uh, it's just um, starting to hurt too much to to breathe at some point, and they say, "Give me liberty or give me death." And uh, I, I, I'm looking out there for maybe there might be a little bit of love and and uh, maybe respect and and some even just manners, you know, manners that maybe your grandma taught you, whereas that you don't have the right to bully somebody out of their stuff. And uh, but uh, they. They make up all the rules on their own, and just like the bullies in the school, they, how can they learn anything else than what they see? Thanks for the call, Cecily. Really appreciate you. 458 Talk is a number. This is Patriots Lament. Who is this? All right, looks like, they again, we had a number of calls come in and uh, not stay on hold. Josh, what, did, what were you going to say? Um, actually, I was going to go back. I don't remember exactly what I was thinking about. I've changed to want to talk about Randy again. But this Republican nonsense. Who, and Randy's even admitted that this is a problem, which underscores it greatly. Who are the main backers of the NDAA? And the, oh, who wrote the NDAA? You're talking about the the, mm-hmm. the, the the National Defense Authorization Act, the one that we've been calling the Indefinite Defense, de, 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 Detention right. Act. Yeah, who, who wrote it? Repu- uh, well, Republican McCain. Lindsey Graham were the two firehouses on the Senate side. It passed the Republican-held House quite easily. And uh, now we're looking at uh, 3166, which takes away your citizenship, um, sponsored and written by a Republican. We're, <laughs> I guess we've asked this for several months, but what are people getting off saying the Republicans are the party of less government and freedom? Maybe it's just le- maybe it's not less government and freedom. Maybe it's less government, more prisons. Oh, oh that'll work. There you go. Don't, have to, don't have to worry about paying out Social Security benefits when you're locked in a cage. <laughs> Four five eight dog is the number. Good morning, caller. Welcome to Patriots Lament. Who's this? The- all right, that was, this is a fun day here. Uh, we've either ruffled some yeah. feathers. Well, this or- might be continuing from last week. Mm-hmm. Oh, I wonder who it is. <laughs> uh, yeah, we can only guess. Okay. Uh, you know what, gentlemen, as we look at this, let me ask you uh, on a very real level, uh, since 
we do not seem to have the legal standing to go in and plead constitutional rights, especially if we dissent. I mean, we can have our citizenship stripped from us for doing nothing more than identifying ourselves as being against the government and the current regime, whichever regime it might happen to be. Uh, What can an individual do uh, short of simply picking up and leaving the country? And even then, I mean, (laughs) at some point that window is going to be closing, and if we don't have the proper paperwork, we will not be leaving. What what can the individual do? Well, you've kind of answered your own question there to some extent. Um, if you think that it's going to get to that point, um, you want to get your get your uh, situation prepared. You know, set up set up a thing overseas somewhere, find property you like, or move some money into a foreign bank account or something like that, because that option will go away in the future. It's basically written in stone. So that's one option. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, we. 50% of Republicans just this last week voted for Romney or Santorum. And so people in this country, by and large, are okay with what's going on. And if they weren't, if a, if a significant number of people or even just a meaningfully large number of people were not okay with what was going on, um, things would start to change. And so, you know, convincing people that it's all, not all, you know, sunshine and roses is uh, that's a pretty big step. Too. I, had, I had a conversation with a really good friend of mine this week, and I love him dearly. I mean, a great friend. And we were talking a little bit about the politics. He was asking me what I thought about the, the Republican primary process and, and the people running. And he said, you know what I think we really need? It's a really good leader. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm, I, he was very sincere. And, and I was like, no, we don't. <laughs> What we need is for individuals to take responsibility for their own actions. We need individuals to take responsibility for their freedoms. We need individuals to actually step up a little bit and, and instead of shuffling off the blame and say, oh, it's not my fault, or, or, or shuffling off the responsibility of providing for your own family and going to the government and saying, please take care of me. And instead of going and saying, please lead us, you be our king, isn't that really the whole idea behind um, why people are so fervent about elections in the first place? Is because they're trying to get that really good leader. I mean, wasn't I mean that's what I heard from everybody about Joe Miller when they were trying to get him in. Is we just needed one good guy. That way we don't have to have any responsibility ourselves. No wonder people cling so hard to their parties. Four five eight talk is the number. We go back to the phones. Good morning, caller. All right, we're doing it again. That's fun. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I would ask if you call into the show to just wait long enough to tell us who you are, and then uh, and then you can go ahead and hang up. That then way. you're actually doing like a, a dial tone remix. Yeah, it's actually that's kind of fun. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. Actually. Throw, yeah. throw in uh, some techno beat there in the background, and we'll be yeah. good to go. All right. So, uh, actually, I kind of got an idea who's doing it. I would much rather hear the dial tone. Oh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, snap. Indeed. <laughs> All right. Uh, let me ask you guys this here. As uh, obviously. Um, Dave, you're talking about, look, we need to just pick up and leave. Um, well, or, I mean, you know, you, you look at the situation and you decide what you're gonna, what you're going to do about it, you know. And if if that's something that you think you would want to do in the future, uh, right, get prepared to do it now because that option is go- it's going to go away. I, 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 there are people out there who don't believe this. You will not be able to leave or you won't be able to take anything, you know, you won't be able to take, take your money, money with, with you, you certainly, and money makes leaving a lot easier. That will happen soon. It's already happening now. The uh, the foreign requirements, the the F bar form, has gone from it used to be a one page kind of trivial form that you filled out on your foreign assets. It's like 15 pages now, and there's a secondary form that's new for 2012 that you have to uh, fill out too. And so all of the uh, ways of holding assets anonymously overseas, which you could do for years and years and years. Um, have gone away. They've all gone away. You have to report everything. And, of course, reporting is the first step towards what? Confiscation. Right. And so this is happening. This is not like a hypothetical situation. It's happening now, and it's it's very real. So if you don't get ready for that, um, you know, if you if that's part of your plan and you don't prepare ahead of time... Um, I think You're gonna that, be screwed. It's better to be. It's better to be a year early than a day late. Right? Exactly. Now, how? How? And I think this is going to be our action point today because we, we've spent a good amount of time on it so far. Specifically, how can we be prepared? You talked about. I mean, we've talked in the past about 
uh, getting our assets moved into precious metals, but how are you going to move uh, gold and silver across the border if it's time to leave? Well, you got to have it stored there ahead of time. You okay. won't be able to take it. I mean, you can take it with you now, which is which is dumb. It's better to have somebody else transport it for you if you're talking about a large amount. But you can buy gold and silver overseas. You can set up an overseas bank account or a, you know a foreign bank account or whatever. These are available. These are options that are available. It takes some time. There's paperwork. You're going to have to report it, which of course you want to report it. The last the whole the whole goal is to preserve your wealth, and you can't do that from a cage if the IRS comes after you. Uh, but there are ways to move it. There are ways to move your assets overseas, and especially important if you do get prosecuted, actually, because you have access to those assets, uh, unlike your U.S. assets. If the IRS comes after you, um, or if you're a domestic terrorist, the IRS will, will close all your accounts. And, and how do you United get identified States. as a domestic terrorist, Dave? By being on this radio show, I Exactly. Think. But, or- so, so then how do you defend yourself? Listening. The, the, first, the, the first thing they do is seize your assets, so you want to have some way to defend yourself because i mean having a having a good attorney makes all the difference so there's just pragmatic practical things about that uh, but if you know if you want to change your own community and your own country or whatever talk to your neighbors um, but if you don't believe that that's going to be 100 percent effective you might want to have a plan b ready to go all right four five eight talk is the number we try again on the phones good morning caller who's this this is g-man g-man go ahead well, we know how they're going to grab the rest of America's wealth, our parents and our grandparents' wealth that we have left, which is pretty much all we have left. My generation holding $18,000 in credit card debt, but all you got to do is trade in your dollar for $10 for one yen, fill in the blank, whatever. But that's not why I called in. Why did you call uh, in? <laughs> Ron Paul is the answer, but... It's not going to happen because you got guys like Randy that believe, I mean, they actually believe in their heart that the Republican Party is the savior, and it's not. They're, uh, they're just a Democrat in a dif- different set of clothes. Um, so if Ron Paul runs as an independent after he loses the nomination and splits the vote like Ross Perot did, we'll get Obama, and then hopefully... Uh, within four years, the whole thing is going to collapse. Do you think that's a good thing, or you think that's the answer? I'll hang up and listen. Oh, gee, man, thanks for that call. <laughs> that's all you. I can definitely tell you that it's not a good thing. And everybody, you know, all the right-wing patriots out there have this dream of a collapse happening so they can go do whatever it is they were planning on doing, which I'm not sure what the hell that or heck that is. <laughs> Long story short, you take your average right-wing quote-unquote patriot and ask them about liberty, ask them about their God-given rights, ask them about where freedom comes from, and I'd like to challenge them and see if they have a clue what that is. And nine times out of ten, I own a tactical store. Okay, I talk to these this particular genre of people every day, every day, and I can tell you... That's a scary prospect to me because they don't even have the first comprehension of where their liberties come from or what they even mean. How are they going to respect mine? If everything fell apart and all these patriots came out, we would just have ourselves X amount of dictators. I can tell you that much right now. People don't have a comprehension. I mean, people call in, call me after the show and say, well, you guys never talk about the solution. Oh, you never talk about the jury. I was talking to Josh the other night. Okay, let's talk about the jury. I think I'd almost rather have one judge biasly putting me in jail and stripping me of my rights and have 12 people that don't understand the first thing about liberty putting me in jail. I mean, come on. Everybody wants to talk about I mean, Frank Turney calls the mm-hmm. show, oh, we got to do the jury, this and that. How? With what educated mm-hmm. people? I've been coming on here with you, Steve, for a year and a half and I have the same people calling me up and don't get the first concept of their own liberty. You gotta be kidding me. What is the answer? Definitely not everything falling apart. That's the scariest prospect I've ever heard. I don't want to live in 1700s France and watch everybody get slaughtered around right. me. Right? Yeah. No, that's that's, uh, that's exactly that's what's totally, coming. There's the yeah. in the in the patriot movement, so-called. There's this myth that it'll be a second American Revolution, but yeah, mm-hmm. you nailed it. It'll be a it'll French be a Revolution. French Revolution. You cannot you cannot have a second American Revolution 
and have no basic concept of where your liberty comes from. It's not possible. Yep. Uh, this is incidentally for, for the for the Schaefer Cox supporters out there. This is one of the things that really sent up the alarm bells for me about him is when he started talking about having setting up a court system in which he would round people up that he did not agree with and have them executed. And I, I heard him talk about that with my own ears. I was there listening to him say this, and that was that made the hackles on the back of my neck just go, woo okay, uh, this is the French Revolution that you're preaching. And uh, th- this is something that, that I don't know. It, if, if you're not talking about running away, and and getting your assets and your family and your life into some other country. Which is what our forebears did when they came exactly. here. Exactly. That's how America started in the first place. Then uh, really what you're looking at is a collapse coming that is going to be worse than anything anyone can imagine. That is going to be a horrible thing. And it's going to be violent and it's going to be bloody. And it is something that you cannot. You, I mean, I don't care how much you shop at Far North Tactical. I don't think you can prepare for that. No, you absolutely can't. You absolutely can't. I mean, that's I've been preaching this to every guy that comes in there that wants to talk about, well, when the government comes to get my guns, I'm going to do something. Yeah, what are you going to do? Are you going to get your own uh, Cobra helicopter gunship? No, and in the back of their minds, what are they really thinking? They're thinking about mass mob rule and them killing everybody around them. That's the exact mentality. I think you need to take a look at history and mm-hmm. take a look at the French history in particular and realize your own stupidity. What, how, do you, how, how do you think that you're going to stand up? I mean, the whole concept is to stand up not just for your rights, but for somebody else's. And we don't even we can't even go five seconds without ripping each other off. Yeah. We're all in it for our own gain. I mean, that's the defining difference. We had a revolution here in America, and the victors didn't go kill the people that lost. That has never happened before, and it's not going to happen ever again. Not by this society, not by this people. But we have a constitution that guarantees that it's not going to happen, Aaron. <laughs> a katapua who? A constitution. Uh, 458 right. talk is <laughs> the wrote, number. Wrote it. Yeah. Um, Go ahead, think, Josh. Uh, you think the people that wrote the constitution said once you lose this thing, you'll never get it back. So, if we have to sit, if we sit here and say that you know, they were, quote, unquote, wise enough to draw this document up. And up to that point, I have to agree, it was pretty fantastic. I mean, the rest of the world said, you guys are rejects. You're stupid. You're retarded. This will never work. Um, so if they were smart enough to come up with this newfound liberty, and they also came up with this idea that once you lose this, you'll never regain it. If we give them credit to write it, we have to give them credit for the other things they said about it. So once we lose it, and we have... We're not going to restore it. They said that. And I think they were wise in that. Not even if we vote for Ron all. Paul? I thought he was the answer. No, absolutely not. All of Ron Paul's doing is trying to get the message of real liberty out there. I don't think he... <laughs> well, uh, he you don't, don't think he think even expects to win? I don't think he expects to win. I don't think he expects... No, I don't, no. I don't think that's his goal, because that would be... You, that would be if that was the end statement, it would be worthless, mm-hmm. because you still have a society of people who don't understand... You know, liberty. And if, if he does win, it'll be because people have suddenly, in the span of a year, rediscovered this concept, which I, I don't think enough people will to to get him elected. But certainly the people who are listening to him are rediscovering it, no. and that's far more meaningful than the number of votes he gets. Word. 458-TALK is the number. Good morning, caller. Welcome to Patriots Lament. Are you still with us? All right, we've managed to clear the lines again. Uh, going, <laughs> yeah, going back to this issue of uh, rediscovering liberty and recognizing that we're not going to restore it under the current system uh, and recognizing that we are looking at a kind of a crackdown on dissenters coming that is going to be bloody, that's going to be um, comprehensive. Our action point today is get your assets out of the country and get ready to leave. Yeah, be honest with yourself about what you're going to do and what you would want to do. I mean, like Aaron was talking about, the, the people coming in his store saying, well, when they come for me, they're not being honest with themselves, right? And then when that day comes, they don't have, they don't actually have a plan. It's a cop-out. It's a cop-out for not preparing and not doing the hard work of talking to their neighbor and not doing the hard work of making sure that they're going to be able to take care of their family. It's like, well, I got, I got my gun and that's, that's good enough. So, yeah, 
think, you know, be honest with yourself about what you're going to do. Right. And I, and my challenge always to the, when they come to get my gun is that's not historically accurate. First of all, this government isn't going to come in and take everybody's guns. That's absolute insanity. That would be a kickoff point for all yeah. Americans to bind together. That, People got to quit telling themselves that there is going there. You're not going to find yourself ever in the scenario where it's going to be easy for you to be patriotic and be a man, ever. Just like with the elections, they're never going to all of a sudden just say, "Yeah, we're canceling the elections," because that would unify people to revolt against them. Right. I mean, why would you want to do that when it's much better? to say, yeah, we're going to have elections again. Come on down and vote. <laughs> yeah, there's not going to be a bright flashing neon sign that says, it's time. Uh, right? Read the tea leaves. You know, look around, see what's, <laughs> see what's happening, and, and prepare accordingly. You know, and for a, for a lot of people, I, th- I think that means, you know, moving assets overseas. The people who are broke and standing in a line trying to get a, you know, a handout for food or whatever, uh, they're not going to be able to do the things that they need to do and and take care of their family in the way that they want to. You don't want to be that guy, right? Especially if you if you think that there's going to be an opportunity to spread a philosophy of liberty or something like that. You can't do that very effectively if you're standing in a breadline. Uh, let me let me ask you this, you know, realistically, I think that our the American empire is too big to effectively govern if uh well, I don't think it's too big to effectively govern in the first place, but I especially if we're talking about a totalitarian kind of a dictatorship. I, I don't think that I, we, I, we are simply too far spread and there are too many people for it to effectively work. How safe are we here in Alaska from having... That question's already been answered. We're not. It is, I yeah. mean, if it gets that big, the bigger it gets, the, the faster it will fall, ultimately, just like the Soviet Union or anything. Right, exactly. But uh, we're not. It's no different. Alaska's not different than the lower 48 because it's geographically separate. All right. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. We are out of time. Uh, contact information, Dave, quickly. Patriotslament.blogspot.com is the website, and patriotslament at gmail.com is the email. All right. We'll see you next week. KFAR Fairbanks, 660 AM, online at kfar660.com.